and something a bit more serious, uh, showing the effects of colonialism in two very distinct places. Firstly, from, from the independent, reburial ceremony held as 400-year-old human skulls returned to Irish Ireland. Trinity College made the decision to return the 13 skulls to Inish Boffin after a working group that examined the legacy issue. This was something of a an argument point uh, recently in Ireland as Trinity College has had these 13 skulls from the island of Inish Boffin bopping about the college for some years. They are going to read out a bit of this and you'll see how they got there. A reburial ceremony has been held on an Irish island as 13 human skulls that were sold by academics more than 100 years ago were returned. The skulls, thought to be around 400 years ago old, were taken from a monastery on the island of Inish Boffin off Ireland's west coast by two Trinity University affiliate academics in 1890. Superb ethics there, chaps. Even for the day, that wasn't exactly ethical behaviour, even in another era. After sketching the skulls in the nook of St. Colban's monastery, considered sacred by the islanders, Alfred C. Haddon and Andrew F. Dixon took the skulls in the middle of the night. Haddon's diary entry stated, when asked by sailors bringing them back to the mainland to hand over the schedule, Dixon would not give it up and told the men it contained poutine, which is a very strong distilled Irish alcohol, as, pro as some listeners are probably aware. So with any further trouble, we got the skulls aboard and then we packed them in Dixon's port band too and locked it in. And no one except our two selves had a, an idea that there are a dozen human skulls on board and they shot no air, though the entry read. Eventually, these skulls ended up wandering around Trinity College, where they were part of a study and were used for things like phrenology and to, and to look at differences in skull types between the Irish or Celtic types and Anglo-Norman types, etc., etc. At this point in time, there's been a, an argument to return them, quite rightly, to their place of rest in Inish Boffin. Headed up by a senior dean at Trinity, the Trinity Legacies Review Working Group researched the issue before offering a number of options to the board of Tri to university on what action it could take. And they ended back on Inish Boffin, where they're being reburied, thankfully. However, they're not the only skulls like that floating around out there. Here we have this poor gentleman from Tanzania searching from his grandfather's skulls. Um, apologies to anyone who might be watching from Tanzania if I mispronounce local names wrong. I can only know so much about so many names in the world at once. To, anyone who wants to correct me is always welcome. Isaria Nel Mele has been looking for his god grandfather's remains for more than six decades. He believes the skulls ended up in a Berlin museum. Lovely. Just where you want your grandfather's remains to end up when he's passed on. Not in the graveyard where you might go and lay some flowers or cremate him or whatever the local respectful practices. But you you know you really want to know that granddad's remains have ended up down in the Berlin Museum. Just what you were aiming for. <sighs> Along with 18 other chiefs and advisors hanged by a German colonial force 123 years ago. After all this time, a German minister has told the BBC the country is prepared to apologise for the execution in what is now northern Tanzania. Oh, only, only a bit of time then. Other descendants have also been searching for the remains, and recently in an unprecedented use of DNA research, two of the skulls of those killed have been identified among a museum collection of, and this puts the situation with Inish Boffin into the pale thousands. It's rare to find an acacia tree on the lower slopes of Mount Kilimanjaro. Its twisting branches reach above the steep road and stand out among the denser lush vegetation. At one time, it shaded a market for the villages of Tisundaya, a part of what is now called Old Mushi, who lived off the fertile land and enjoyed the cooler temperatures that the higher altitude brought. But this focal point for the community became the scene of a great tragedy. Despite the peace of the natural surroundings today, its impact has reverberated down the decades. It was here on the 2nd of March 1900, as the descendants tell it, one by one the 19 men were hanged. They had been hastily tried the day before, accused of plotting to attack the German colonial forces and dehumanised, it would appear, even after death. Germany's claim to this part of the continent was formalised at the Berlin Conference of 1884 and 1885. The European empires divided up Africa between them without the people living there having any say in what happened. Mangi Meli, the most prominent Mangi, a chief among those who were killed, 
had in 19, 1892 successfully defeated the German forces. But, but that annoyed them. That success was later reversed, and by the end of the 19th century, the Europeans were keen to stamp this authority on what was known as German East Africa. They wanted to make an example of Mangi Meli and other local re- who may have been planning an uprising. As you can see, this lovely, and I use the word lovely in inverted commas, postcard from 1910 is believed to show the acacia tree where the men were hanged in 1900. The humiliation did not end there. While most of the tr- horses are believed to be buried in a mass grave somewhere near the tree, their heads were removed, packed up and sent 6,600 kilometres away to the German capital. In some case, the complete fellows were shipped. It's a bit hard to understand that sort of stuff from our own standpoint, but that's not even treating these people like they were even humans. So this 92-year-old man talking here is uh, spent a lot of his lifetime looking for his grandfather's skull in a Berlin museum. And here we go. Since at least the 1960s, Mr. Melly had been writing to the German and Tanzanian authorities urging to look for his reigns of his grandfather. Fantastic silliness. You know, it should have just been as simple as, sorry about that, different era. Heroes, are your family remains returned. Our apologies. Unfortunately, this is not what happened. He says that officials tried to put him off by telling that relevant records had been destroyed during World War II, but Mr. Melly was not deterred. I'm going to leave people to read the rest of the article, but... It illustrates how colonialism in two very separate lands serve to dehumanise people's the remains of people after death. Most people would like to think that when their relatives, such as parents, grandparents, uncles, aunties, have passed on, that they will either be cremated or buried or interred in some respectful manner. Not that someone will run off with them and stick them in a museum or study them in Trinity College down in Dublin. I wonder how many more exhibits like this are wandering around the back rooms of various museums still. I should imagine there are quite a few.